I'm so excited to be here tonight with these writers. Um, I selfishly put together an event that would uh, keep me going <laughs> through those last few months of 2020. Um, and so I picked six writers who, whose writing I love, whose presence I love, and who just fill me with inspiration every time I get to see them. Um, and since I never get to see them in real life anymore, now I get to see them on my computer screen. So um, I'm going to introduce our first reader, Chris Gonzalez, in a minute, and then Chris will read, uh, and then I'll come, I'll pop back into your screen to introduce our next reader, and so forth. We'll do some quick conversation after that, and um, then we'll take your questions. So please do populate that Q and A feature, as Michael mentioned, um, so that we can get to what you're most interested in. Okay, hang on, just one sec. Christopher Gonzalez is a fiction editor at Barrel House. His writing has appeared in The Nation, Best Small Fiction's 2019, Little Fiction, The Forge, Split Lip, Cosmonauts Avenue, and elsewhere. His debut st short story collection, I Am Not Hungry But I Could Eat, is forthcoming from Santa Fe Writers Project, Writer Project. He lives in Brooklyn, New York, but mostly on Twitter at Lives in Pages, and you should definitely follow him because he is hilarious. Uh, and Chris, I am so, so, so excited about the book news. So that is some, some exciting uh, stuff to head into the next year with. So I'm hoping you might be reading something, something from that project, but if you're not, no pressure. And now I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute myself and turn it over to you. Hi, thank you, Marissa. Thank you, uh, Books Are Magic and everyone for coming out tonight. Um, uh, I'm excited to be here. I admire every single writer I'm reading with. Um, unfortunately, I'm not reading from my collection, <laughs> but uh, I'm reading two very short flash pieces. Um, I'll get into the first one called Minor Grievances. Adam tells me no one else will be by the water after such a bad snowfall. Edgewater Park should be deserted, just us in the lake, frozen into solid hills. It would be quiet, which I preferred, I kept quiet about a lot, like the Grinder app I downloaded onto my phone as soon as I turned 18, how I've scrolled down that wall of guys, those photos of abs and round bellies and the few faces concealed beneath the bill of a trucker's camouflage snapback. I've tapped, 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 tapped the flame icon and a number of profiles, hoping to create a breadcrumb trail to the man of my dreams. At least today, it's led me to Adam. There are no other cars around, so Adam drives onto the beach, parks close to the water. Maybe when we finish, we can climb the waves and walk across them all the way to Canada. I don't laugh, but sense that I should. He squeezes the steering wheel. The entire ride up, I hadn't said a word. Come on, that was funny, he says. Picture it, you, me, and Justin Trudeau frolicking. Sorry, sorry, I'm having a moment. I point out the window. There's still some sunlight over the lake. I want to thaw out under its burning glow. Yeah, it's beautiful, huh? Almost as pretty as you. He moves his hand from the wheel to my thigh, begins sliding it closer to my crotch. I've been here many times before. All those Friday nights spent following Siri's voice across Northeast Ohio, spider webbing down back roads and alleyways to meet some random guy in the black mouth of night. I place my hand over Adam's, try to absorb all of its heat in my palm, then his mouth is on mine and I wince at his cold tongue. My lips crack and sting at the edges and his beard scrapes too roughly along my chin. But these are minor grievances. I keep quiet and lean back in the passenger seat, familiarize myself with the sensation of his body pressed against mine. The guys I connect with are always older, sometimes by decades. They're white men, mean men, greedy men. They live in dark houses, keep to themselves. On occasion, they own a dog. They shoot guns and kill fish and salute the flag and pretend they fit into the idea of a nation that wants very little to do with them and nothing to do with me. And still, I slide beneath these men, risk disappearing altogether. Perhaps I'm already gone. Neither Adam nor I make any sounds of pleasure, then it ends. After, we walk along the edge of the lake where the ice meets untouched snow. He climbs onto the lake and reaches down to help me up. It's eerie, the waves are so still. I can almost hear them crashing into one another. Can't stop imagining all that movement exactly as they should be. And the second piece I'm gonna read is a micro called In the Aftermath of Hurricane Maria. The other Puerto Rican from work lives alone, 
deep in Queens. He invites me over to watch the news coverage. We drink Bacardi meat, suck its heat through our back teeth. He worries a rosary between callous fingers. The gesture could make this once Catholic boy into a new Catholic man, but I remember the papery taste of communion wafers and a mouth slick with cum. I remember false confessions, the truth a lump in my throat. He takes my hand in prayer, but salvation isn't coming. It's passed right through us. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chris. Those were beautiful. Okay, next up we have Megan Steelstra. Um, Megan is the author of three collections, Everyone Remain Calm, Once I Was Cool, and The Wrong Way to Save Your Life, winner of the 2017 Book of the Year Award from the Chicago Review of Books. Her work appears in the Best American Essays, New York Times, The Believer, Law Reads, Tin House, and on National Public Radio. She is a 2020 Shearing Fellow with the Black Mountain Institute in Las Vegas and a 2021 Civic Media Fellow with the Annenberg Innovation Lab at the University of Southern California and teaches creative nonfiction at Northwestern University. She's also one of the warmest people I've ever met. We've only met once in real life and yet somehow it feels like we know each other deeply um, and I love her dearly and I am thrilled to have her read with us tonight. So Megan, I'm gonna mute myself and kick it over to you. Thank you so much. Marissa, I am hugging you from across the internet. Uh, I'm so happy to be here with all of you. Thank you. Uh, this is the beginning to a longer essay. It's called An Axe for the Frozen Sea. One, I throw two-handed, fists stacked at the base of the axe handle. My right foot is at the line, my left just behind and I rock. My body weight shifting forward, back, forward, back. This strength is mine. This body, mine. The target, concentric rings painted on two by 10 pine boards and drilled into the wall. It's 15 feet in front of me. 15 feet is the full rotation of an ax. When I started throwing axes, I read articles by physicists about velocity and angle and centrifugal force. I read governing rules from the National Axe Throwing Federation and the World Axe Throwing League, including etiquette, scoring, and foot faults. I watched countless instructional videos, the majority featuring dudes in fields, and one where the actor Jason Momoa nails a bullseye while drinking a very large beer. I watched that last one many times. I bring both hands back over my head. The blade is straight. My elbows are at my ears and I'm gripping the handle and everything in me. I don't know how else to say this, sighs. The knots in my neck untie, brambles in my back untangle. This is what child's pose used to feel like, the relaxation, the release. But yoga isn't working for me right now. Neither is bourbon. I've been drinking too much or sleeping, not much at all, or deep breaths or petting dogs or social media breaks or any of a thousand things we do to stay calm. Don't tell me to be calm. I am not fucking calm. I could explode this city with the sheer force of my rage. I let go of the ax. Sliced air and the gunshot of steel on board. The blade sinks and sticks in the splintered wood just to the right of the third ring. That's okay. I don't care about points. I'm not here to win. I'm not here to compete in a league or hang out with friends or even hit the target. I want to split open. Two. I've read enough of this country's history and poetry to know that rage is nothing new but the policies and rhetoric of our current administration have kicked it screaming to the center. There are moments from this time that I will never unsee. Children in cages under foil blankets, hundreds of shoes left at the Capitol building in Puerto Rico that belonged to people who died during Hurricane Maria. A statement by a tiki torch manufacturer saying that they didn't support white supremacists. A child-sized bulletproof backpack in polka dot pink sold for $114 on Amazon. A photo of white men in suits congratulating one another as they legislate our bodies. A photo of Merrick Garland. A photo of Sandra Bland. Indeliable in the hippocampus is the laughter. 
Last March, I spent an hour on the floor of my office when the university where I teach went on lockdown due to an active shooter. My son's elementary school a mile away was on lockdown too. Later, once he could see past the terror of his own imagination, he had a question. He has a lot of questions. Why don't people want his uncles to get married? Why did we have to wait until the first of the year to go to the doctor? Why can he play with squirt guns in the front yard and his cousin cannot? What is treason? This time he asked if I had been scared. It already felt like another lifetime, lights off, door locked under my desk, trying to breathe. I don't do well with shootings. I don't think anyone should do well with shootings, but no, I said to my son, I wasn't scared. I was angry. I am angry. I think anger is a pretty logical response to the world. It's beneficial, a warning sign that something is wrong and needs our attention. It shows us where the fight is. When I feel it, the lightning bolt zipping up my spine, yelling what in the actual fuck at my newsfeed, I try to think, oh, how can I be of use? A DIY sort of classical conditioning, turning the visceral, ugly emotion into a positive response working with young people, donating what I can, supporting local organizers and progressive candidates, listening to their expertise and amplifying their efforts. The seemingly small stuff too, shoveling my neighbor's sidewalk, carrying around hand warmers for people who are cold, carrying cash to tip, tipping well, listening well, my writing and my parenting and my body in the street, three, and yet, the lightning bolt. What the actual fuck? I'm reading about the difference between anger, the feeling, and rage. What happens when the feeling goes unchecked, when we don't listen to our bodies? Picture it like this. If anger is the warning siren, rage is the tornado that shows up after the siren's been going off for decades and we didn't pay attention to the blaring goddamn noise, I am pulling out clumps of my own hair. I'm gnawing on the insides of my cheeks. I'm dropping dishes, the satisfaction of the crash, bare feet bloody on the kitchen floor. Here is my body, spiked adrenaline, skewed temporal perspective and high endurance. Like when I was 18 working night shifts at Arby's and I stuck my hand in the deep fryer. My jaw is locked, my pulse fast forward. Lately, lately, I've noticed that my butt hurts. A physician friend explained that we hold tension in our pelvic muscles and everybody's walking around with their asses clenched. I am always hot, my internal thermostat cranked. Someone on the internet suggested it was menopause and I killed him with my brain. I am doing a lot of awful things with my brain. I am Dark Willow in season six of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I am Jean Grey when she morphs into the Phoenix and atomizes the professor. I'm a woman in America in 2018. My imagination is a dangerous place. In an interview about her book, Anger and Forgiveness, University of Chicago philosopher Martha Nussbaum named something that felt vital like she was reaching through the words and talking just to me. With lots of things, say having good health or a fit body, we think that's worth working on every day. But somehow we give ourselves a pass when it comes to anger. I don't want a pass. I want to see this rage. Four, I have recently started therapy. Five, and axe throwing. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. That was beautiful and powerful. And one day I will get to see you in real life again and we will go throw axes. Okay, next up is Courtney Lamar Charleston, whose official bio I will read you in a moment. But first I need to tell you that if you love the poetry you read, on the rumpus, Courtney Lamar Charleston is one of the major forces behind that. Uh, this, this fellow is a superstar and um, the work he's done in the last couple of years, two years, three years, who knows what time is anymore, um, with me and, and Carolina and Nicholas and the rest of the team has just amazed me continuously. So Courtney, I wanna give you a special thank you as we head into another year of beautiful and powerful poetry. 
Okay, now here's Courtney's official bio. Um, Courtney Lamar Charleston is the author of Telepathologies, selected by D.A. Powell for the 2016 Saturnalia Books Poetry Prize, and the forthcoming Doppelgangbanger, out from Haymarket Books in early 2021. He was awarded a 2017 Ruth Willie and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellowship from the Poetry Foundation, and he has also received fellowships from Cave Canem, the Conversation Literary Festival, and the New Jersey State Council on the Arts. Winner of a Pushkar Prize, his poems have appeared in Poetry, the American Poetry Review, the Kenyan Review, Granta, The Nation, and elsewhere. He serves as poetry editor at The Rumpus and on the editorial board at Alice James Books. Okay, Courtney, I'm going to shut up now and let you talk. Thanks, Marissa. And uh, thank you to um, everyone who's joining all of us tonight and uh, taking a little bit of time to commune over language uh, it feels really, really good to be here and I'm really appreciative. I won't talk too long because I wanna get to the poems. I have a few to read, um, but I also wanted to thank our lovely interpreter for uh, doing such great work and making this programming accessible tonight. I really appreciate that. Okay, now with that being said to the poems. Biden versus Trump. I'm biding time, that's all biting the bullet. This isn't the way it should be, but this is the way it is. We call the lesser evil uncle, like a cry out for mercy, when our real uncles twisted our supple brown arms like soft pretzels. It was a game we played. I, unmistakably kid, knew what a police officer was back then, but not a cop. It's not a game anymore. A knee on the neck or seven shots in the back in front of your baby boys. The incumbent says, I think the concept of a chokehold sounds so innocent, so perfect. I taste smoke when I repeat it. Four gray hairs in four years is what my wife told me about. Not necessarily what she counted curling from my scalp like a pig's tail. So much these days is political theater, but so much more is cruelty. I want to be spared as long as possible, preferably past the age of 30. I wash my hands till they tear from friction. I wear my face mask in public over the mask that is my face, since God helps those who help themselves. God help us if you're still there. I'm still here, still, motion's antonym in anatomical form. That's anxiety at work, that's anger. If I was an automatic weapon, this would all be so easy to conceal against the small of a back. I ain't a killer, but white men get radicalized every day and it's totally accepted. Meanwhile, I'm out here riding to the poles on a donkey, looking less like Jesus than a jackass. Just once, I'd like to have a real choice in front of me, but yet again, I'm the little man behind the curtain peddling and peddling shallow talking points so as not to scare precious votes away. It's painful to say, but there's no such thing as magic. There's only heart, brains, and courage. I've chosen to love myself even more than I hate the president, which is no small feat. I'm trembling, yes, but I'm not terrified. I know what I have to do and he does too. I have to remember this all started because he feared our ascendance, not the other way around. My uncle says, as a black man, there's only one way I can vote in this situation. I cry out uncle as they cuff me fold me into myself like a note passed to avoid breaking a silence in the air. Okay, next poem. It's important I remember that dropping a bomb on an occupied row house was unconscionable, but it happened here on American soil, West Philadelphia, 1985, 
the year most of the country remembers for the Chicago Bears Super Bowl shuffle, reducing the atrocity to a footnote of a footnote of the Reagan years, the nation marching rightward, wearing a telegenic smile. The sky was blue that day, as blue as a cop or a Democrat's tie on the debate stage. Wilson Good was Philadelphia's mayor then, Democrat, Black, if you can believe it, and I can, because US racism is no stranger to Black face by face paint or by borrow. A bomb in a satchel bag. I can believe it because I am Black, actually. It, it fell from the sky like a Berlin care package back in 48, the sky that was as blue as a cop after the police had already put tens of thousands of bullets through the building's walls. The bomb broke the row house, flames broke out the flames, broke into neighboring homes like the thieves they were until another 65, housing, how, another 65 houses were stolen in one move. Move was the target. The alleged terrorists though, also the ones without a bomb to let fly bald faced. Everybody in the row house was move. Everybody in the row house was Africa. Everybody black is Africa. Everybody black was in that row house, that row house in the birthplace of the United States of America. 11 of 13 died, five children. One woman went to prison for not frying in the fire. She was not a cop, not anyone receiving pay from the city. She was Africa, so she was everybody black. America bombed my house in a former life. America imprisoned me in a former life. America killed me, a child, in a former life. In 2008, when I touched down in Philly for school, Obama was running for president a Chicago Democrat, black if you can believe it. I could see the smoke from the window as the plane descended to tarmac. I was reminded who I was, that I once lived in the birthplace of America until I was moved out, to put it mildly. Been on the move ever since, from body to body, everybody in black. Okay, and then I'll wrap up with a shorter one. It's important I remember that Nina Simone wrote Mississippi Goddamn in less than one hour. And she meant every word from the soles of her feet to the top of her lungs. At times the lyric is insistent, immaculate conception, which is to say, perhaps that urgency is God and God is an urgency. Medgar was dead, and so were the four little girls. The song was first inscribed in wax at Carnegie Hall in New York City, the lonely black songstress staged before the overwhelmingly white audience, bearing her soul while damning the nations if it had one to damn it all. Southern states banned the show tune that showed too much nerve that incited crowds to coordinated acts of resistance. When Phillips Records sent the single to radio stations across the country, they were returned with the vinyl broken clean in half. But I've long wondered if that was entrenched refusal of the truth or a matter of art imitating life so precisely that the records themselves, sometime during transport, had become Nina's heart. Thank you. He's a superstar. Uh, thank you, Courtney, so much for being here tonight. Okay, we're about halfway through, so I'm just going to quickly remind everyone who is here with us tonight that if you have questions for these brilliant minds that you are hearing read to you, please drop them in that Q&A feature um, that you'll find at the bottom of your screen if you're on a desktop, and I believe Michael said the top corner of your screen if you're on a mobile device, but it says Q&A. Click there. Put your question in and we'll get to it uh, when we wrap up. Okay, um, 
keeping it going. Next up, we have Danielle Evans. Um, I have been trying to get Danielle uh, for a Rumpus event for a very long time. And I she has put up very gracefully with my pestering her in her inbox until we finally had a date that worked. And so I am really excited that she's here tonight. Danielle Evans is the author of the story collections, The Office of Historical Corrections, and Before You Suffocate Your Own Full, full Self. Her work has won awards and honors, including the Penn American Robert W. Bingham Prize, the Hurston Wright Award for Fiction, and the National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship. Her stories have appeared in magazines and anthologies, including the Paris Review, American Short Fiction, Callaloo, the Best American Short Story, and the Best American Short Stories. She teaches in the writing seminars at John Hopkins University, and she's going to read to us now. Hi. Um, so they asked us to read things that felt appropriate for 2020. So this starts funny and then gets bleak and then ends on a note of grief. Um, because here we are. Uh, this is. I'm just going to read the beginning of one of the stories from my new collection called Happily Ever After. When Lissa was seven, her mother took her to see the movie where the mermaid wants legs. And when it ended, Lissa shook her head and squinted at the prince and said, why would she leave her family for that? Which for years contributed to the prevailing belief that she was sentimental or soft hearted. When in fact, she just knew a bad trade when she saw one, the whole ocean for one man. Not that she knew much about the ocean. Lissa had been born in a landlocked state and at 30, it seemed the closest she might get to the sea was her job working the gift shop in the lobby of the Titanic. It was not a metaphor. It was an actual replica of the Titanic with a mini museum on the lower level. So most of their business came from weddings and children's birthday parties hosted on the upper decks. The ship-shaped building was a creation of the late 90s, the pet project of an enterprising educational capitalist who wanted to build an attraction both rigorous in its attention to historical detail and visually stunning. To preserve history, he said to the public, to capitalize off of renewed interest in the disaster, he said to his investors. He had planned to build to scale, but that plan hadn't survived initial cost estimates. They'd only ever had a quarter of the passenger rooms the actual Titanic had, and most of those rooms were now unfurnished and used as storage closets, their custom bed frames sold secondhand during the last recession. At the end of the summer season, a second tier pop star rented the whole structure for a music video shoot, shutting down normal operations for three full days. Lissa had been planning on having the time off, but when the video's director came to finalize the plans for the space, he'd stopped in front of the shop glass, stared for a minute, then walked in and said, you, you're perfect. She agreed to remain on site for the filming and cancel the doctor's appointment she'd already rescheduled twice, giving herself in her head the lecture she imagined the doctor would have if he answered his own phone. Her coworker Mackenzie sulked around the ship for the rest of the afternoon, flinging herself into the director's line of vision without success. Mackenzie sometimes worked the gift shop counter with her, but only sometimes. Whenever there was a princess party, Mackenzie wore the costume dress and chaperoned as the princess on deck. Lissa never worked parties. The one time anyone had bothered to give her an explanation for this, she hadn't asked. It was a supervisor who mumbled something about historical accuracy, meaning no black princesses. We'd hate for the six-year-olds having tea parties on the Titanic to get the wrong idea about history, Lissa said, so straight-faced that the supervisor failed to call her out for attitude. I guess they must want diversity, Mackenzie said after the director left, using air quotes for diversity, even though it was the literal word she meant. The next day, and as Mackenzie went, genuinely conciliatory. Maybe he wants to fuck you? He was cute in a New York way. I bet he thinks you're exotic. Exotic, not so much. The theme of the music video was sea monsters. Everyone in it, including the pop star and Lissa, would be painted with green body paint and spritzed with shimmer and filmed through a Vaseline lens that would add to the illusion that they were underwater. The pop star didn't want a ship. She wanted a shipwreck. Lissa was just supposed to wear her regular uniform and work the counter and be herself in costume makeup. Most of the real action took place on the upper decks. In two days of shooting, Lissa only saw the pop star from a distance through the glass, but a longtime backup dancer gossiped about her during a coffee break. The pop star dedicated this video to an ex who told a tabloid she let herself go and look like a monster in recent photos. The video was about letting herself go, appearing on screen green and fat and nearly naked. The pop star was thinner than Lissa had ever been in her life. Lissa understood why she'd been picked and not Mackenzie. They needed someone in the store who could look like she knew what she was doing behind the counter. She was backdrop. 
But the director did apparently also want to fuck her, though it seemed as much an afterthought as anything, the kind of whim that came to the kind of man who always wanted to fuck somebody. When they weren't filming, the pop star and her assistant and her dancers traveled together like a swarm of fireflies, and the director and the tech crew and the hair and makeup artist were left to less glamorously fend for themselves. After they'd shut down for the second day, Lissa's last day of filming, the director appeared as she was locking up the store and asked if she wanted a drink. Okay, she said. I haven't been here long enough to find a good bar, but I've got a great bottle of scotch back at the hotel, he said. Lissa saw the opening. She had been here all her life. She could tell him where a good bar was. She did not. In the hotel bathroom, she scrubbed off the stubborn lingering bits of the green makeup and tried to look as respectable as the woman about to fuck a stranger could. When she came out, he had poured them drinks and didn't seem to notice she was fully human colored again. She took a sip and put the drink down and he reached for her hand, turned her palm over and began to trace something in it. Are you trying to tell my fortune? She asked. I wasn't, he said, but I have a lucky guess that you're about to make a man very happy. It was so gross, it was almost endearing. The first time they used the condom in the hotel's romance kit, which consisted of a single condom and a package of after dinner mints and a tin adorned with a rose sticker. The second time he pulled out and the third time he didn't. Was that okay? I mean, I know I'm safe, he said, but are you on something? You don't have to worry about that, she said. I don't have ovaries. Hmm? My mom died of cancer, so they took mine out to be safe. See the scar? She turned onto her back and pointed to the faint line across her abdomen. I'm sorry, he said, placing a palm on her stomach. It's fine, she said. You don't have to pretend it's okay, he said. We don't have to be friends, she said. She did, in fact, have ovaries, but she also had a period you could set a watch by and an app that told her which weeks not to worry about carelessness. The scar on her belly was from an appendectomy she'd had as a teenager and was the wrong direction for what it would have been if she'd had the other surgery. She was not supposed to still have the ovaries. A year and a half ago, her mother had gone to the hospital with the intake doctor called textbook appendicitis symptoms and died of cancer 11 months later. Because hospice was for people who intended to die and Lisa's mother didn't, she had refused to go. She died in the regular hospital admitted through the ER, which meant even though she'd been remanded to the comfort care team, the doctor on rounds was officially required to come in once a day and report to Lisa that her mother was still dying. He was kind about it, if not particularly attentive. Her mother was too drugged up to take the message herself, and the doctor was young and seemed embarrassed to be there, which was fair, Lissa supposed. She too had stopped acting like this moment was anything but private. In the very beginning, when they'd still thought something could be done, Lissa had gone to every new doctor's appointment dressed like it would be a photo shoot. She bought clothes she couldn't afford, taken off early from work to press her hair, never met a new doctor without a full face of makeup. There was always something they wouldn't tell everybody and she wanted to be told, which meant she had to look like a real person to them, like a person whose mother deserved to live, like someone who loved somebody. Whatever information they weren't gonna give her, whatever medicine they didn't bother trying on black women, she would have to ask to get, would have to ask for directly so that it went in the file if they refused, but ask for without seeming stupid or aggressive or cold. She would have to be poised and polite through her frustration, which thankfully retail had prepared her for. Tell me what you would tell a white woman, her face said. A white woman with money, her clothes said. Please, her tone said. But eventually, all the doctors told her the same thing, and Lissa accepted there was nothing left to ask for. Thank you, Danielle. That was wonderful. Okay, next we have Melissa Fibos, and I'm trying to think of what I can tell you about Melissa before I read her official bio that won't make me start sobbing. Um, because Melissa is that kind of person and I love her very much and I think the thing I want to say is that um, the rumpus as you know it today with me in charge would not have happened if Melissa did not tell me you can do this um, because she was the person I called and I said I don't think I can do this and she said you can do this and she has not stopped telling me you can do this uh, since that day four and a half years ago um, and I am um, endlessly and forever grateful for her support. And I know that she does this for so many of us in the community. And um, I am just thankful that she exists in the world. And here is her official bio. Melissa Phoebos is the author of the memoir, Whip Smart from St. Martin's Press and the essay collection, Abandon Me, Bloomsbury 2017. Her third book, Girlhood, an illustrated essay collection is forthcoming on March 30th from Bloomsbury and is a Rumpus Book Club pick. More on that at the end of the event. A craft book, Body Work, is forthcoming in 2022 from Catapult. She has been awarded prizes and fellowships from Lambda Literary, McDowell, Breadloaf Writers Conference, 
Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, Vermont Studio Center, the Barbara Deming Memorial Foundation, the Bow Institute at the Camargo Foundation, Ragdale, Prairie Schooner, and others. Her essays have recently appeared in Tin House, Granta, The Paris Review, The Sun, McSweeney's, The Believer, and The New York Times. She's an associate professor at the University of Iowa, where she teaches in the nonfiction writing program. Melissa, take it away. Thank you so much, Marissa. Um, that was really nice. Uh, and you've done such an amazing job with the rumpus. Um, I'm really, really glad that you decided to do it and that you continue to decide to do it. Um, and I want to thank you and our two interpreters in Books Are Magic, and especially Michael, who is one of my favorite booksellers in the world, and all my fellow readers. These readings have been fucking amazing. They're so good. Um, I'm very honored to be among you all. And given that 2020 has been such a trash fire, I thought I would read something about really good fucking. I thought we could all use that. So it starts off with a little body shame because we do have to ease into it, right? Um, and I basically sort of cut out all of the narrative uh, sinew out of this essay. So it might not entirely make sense. It might just go straight like body shame, great fucking, but I think that you all can handle it. So um, this is from a much, much, much longer essay that's in my new book. Um, and the essay is called Wild America. Hold on, I gotta start my timer because I'm terrified of being that reader. Okay. Um, Eloise Brill and I sat on the beach at Goodwill Pond while nearby our fellow campers ate cellophane wrapped sandwiches on rotting picnic tables. It was the summer of 1989 and our parents had enrolled us in afternoon swim camp at the public pond. I had just won the afternoon's timed race and was buoyant with my victory. Are you a lesbian? Eloise asked me. Smug as only a nine-year-old with a new word can be. I don't know, I said, what's a lesbian? Give me your hand, she said. And when I did, she pressed hers against mine, the grit of sand between our sticky palms. Someone's happy scream bounced across the water followed by a splash. Eloise squinted at the tops of our fingers. See, she said, your ring finger is longer than your pointer finger. That means you're a lesbian. I drew my hand back to examine it. She was right. What else might my body reveal about me that even I didn't know? The thought crept through me like a shadow. Consider the Hecaton Hires, three children of Uranus and Gaia. They were named for their hundred hands. Cottus, the striker, Gyges, the big limbed, and Briarius, the sea goat, maker of storms. They were giants who grew up to defeat the Titans. They were earthquakes and sea storms, powerful beyond measure. Now, consider the Hecaton Hires before all of that, not as triumphant warriors, not as the guardians of Tartarus at the beginning. What is a sea storm as a child? How does an earthquake begin to know itself? That first rumble you hear and think, me. Our power may be innate, but we learn its meaning from others. No one is born knowing the difference between a sea god and a sea monster. What if no one told you that you were a Hecaton Hire? Where would you hide all those hands? How could you not start to hate them? I was a passionate child with calloused feet and lots of words. I talked fast and moved faster through the woods around our home, up trees and into the ocean's crashing surf. I would read or think or feel myself into a brimming state, not joy or sorrow, but some apex of their intersection, the raw matter from which each was made, and then lie with my back to the ground, body vibrating, heart thudding, mind foaming, thrilled and afraid I might combust, might simply die of feeling too much. I watched nature specials on public television and thought, maybe. Maybe no one else recognized themselves in the hyena's red grin, her ruthless neck, Maybe no one else's heart raced, fists clenched, unable to tell if she was more impala or lion. Well, I did. Alone in the woods behind our house, I had beaten my chest, acted out my own invented stories without a thought to how another's gaze might see me. I was covered in scabs and bruises. I was sun browned, full of size, and interested in every orifice. I was an animal. By middle school, this felt like a disgusting secret because I was also a girl. I inherited a lot from my mother, though I first recognized my hands. We have long fingers, wide palms, and strong nails. They don't carry our ring sizes at mall kiosks. We shop for gloves in the men's section of department stores. 
as an adolescent, it struck me as unfair because my mother was beautiful with fine features and dizzying cheekbones. But me, I felt too beast to be beautiful. I was a hecatonchire among humans. My hands gave me away. In school, I learned to talk less. I moved slower and hid my body in clothes, but not my hands. They remained maps that led to the truth of me. I was not a ballerina. I was a third baseman. They would never let me become the kind of girl I'd learned I should be. It's a lesbian cliche, the first date hand comparison, not so widely known as the U-Haul joke, but a hallmark of every romance I've ever had with a woman. Straight people do it too, but the interaction doesn't hold quite the same charge because men and women don't primarily fuck each other with their hands. I have really big hands, I always announced when I saw the moment coming. So do I, my dates often replied. Whenever I read that part, it always feels like a brag, but it, but that's not actually how I wrote it. Uh, mine were always bigger. My fingers stretched longer and my palms wider than those of women six inches taller than me. My hands were brazenly big, unabashedly big. There was no getting around them. If I had been fucking my lovers more, I would have gotten over it faster. And if I didn't hate my hands, I definitely would have been fucking my lovers more. I don't believe and didn't then that all sex ought to be perfectly reciprocal, but I knew that ours wasn't in part because I was afraid. I was afraid that they wouldn't like it or that I wouldn't. I was afraid that I would like it and find myself repulsive. Worse, that they would find me repulsive. I was still afraid of being that animal. So there's a bunch of rising action here and some very meticulously described personal transformation, but I'm skipping over all of it to get straight to the redemptive fucking, so you're welcome. In Canto six of his epic satire, Don Juan, Byron contemplates his own adoration of all women and muses of the Hecaton Hire, enviable Briarius, with thy hands and heads, hadst thou all things multiplied in proportion, to which I say, only a man would think 100 dicks are better than one. Only a person who doesn't know that thy hands and heads can indeed be all things. Today, my love has no aversion to being fucked. Our fucking is no partially clothed one-way activity. When my long fingers, my strong fingers slide inside her, she writhes and mews and grunts, yes, like an animal. We are animals, never more than now. For a sliver of time, I sometimes step out of myself like a wheel that's lost its track. I see my body crouched over her, thighs flexed, back slick with sweat, face dumb with desire, mouth open, and I shudder, ready to tuck it all back in and make myself small again. But to do that would mean leaving her here alone in this bed, leaving this here that exists only between both of our bodies, so I don't. I blink twice and step back into myself. More, she instructs me, and I have more to give. My hands are enormous. They are brazenly big, unabashedly big, hungry and huge and beloved. The desire they enact, this desire we share, is earthquakes and sea storms. It blinds our thoughts and clenches our eyes and makes us pray to gods we don't believe in. It washes us on the shore of the bed, slack and salt crusted, wrecked by pleasure. All that time, I thought it was my hands who needed to shrink when it was I who needed to grow into them. Thanks so much. Thank you, Melissa. I love that essay. Um, okay, we have one more reader tonight. And that reader is none other than Kava Akbar, um, another person for whom I am hard pressed to come up with something to say that's not going to make me teary, although it is 2020 and kind of anything can make me cry. So there's that too. Kava is, um, Kava is an inspiration to me and I think to a lot of people in the literary community. Um, and he is a poet who takes my breath away when he reads. Um, and every time I hear him read, I come away with something different um, and, and I learn something. And I think that that's a gift he gives us. So I'm gonna introduce him properly with his bio and then I'm gonna let him give you that gift. Okay, Kava Akbar's debut collection, Calling a Wolf a Wolf was published in 2017 by Alice James Books. His second full length volume of poetry, Pilgrim Bell will be published by Grey Wolf on August 3rd and is a, rump a rumpus poetry book club pick. He is also the author of the chapbook Portrait of the Alcoholic, published in 2016 by Sibling Rivalry Press, and is currently editing an anthology of poetry for the, of the spirit for Penguin Classics, forthcoming in April 2021. 
the recipient of honors, including a Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellowship from the Poetry Foundation, multiple Pushkar Prizes, the Levi Reading Prize, and a, Luc a Lucille Medwick Memorial Award from the Poetry Society of America. Kava was born in Tehran, Iran, and teaches at Purdue University and in the low residency MFA programs at Randall Randolph College and Warren Wilson, because he is also one of the busiest literary citizens that I know. Okay, Kave, please finish us out and then we will head into our conversation. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Marissa. Um, it's an incredible thing that you do here. And I know that it's largely um, thankless a lot of the time and a lot of the work is hidden and deeply unsexy and behind screens and in boxes and um but it matters deeply in the lives of countless people who you'll never meet um and has mattered deeply in the lives of countless many people who you'll never ever hear from um and that's the coolest thing um that your uh your stewardship has carried these words and these voices to so many people um, for whom they may be life or soul saving. Um, and that's, that's about the highest praise that any of us can be given. So thank you so much, Marissa, for that. Um, thank you too, to um, Lori for, um, for doing this cool act of interpretation um, for us, uh, reminding us that language is a medium and a creative practice. And it's cool to see, um, it's cool to see that enacted before our eyes, um, uh, the creative art of language being um, practiced and not just, you know, me reading some poems that I wrote, you know, who knows how long ago. Um, <clears throat> and thank you to the, to the readers here too. Um, I love all of you. Um, and I love all of your work. I was just looking, I just looked at that uh, Books Are Magic link because I was like, I'm going to cop some of these. Uh, and I realized that I already owned every single one of, <laughs> every single one of the books that they have for sale from all of you, which is, uh, or, you know, um, or have uh, in one case pre-ordered uh, the book that is coming out already. Um, but I'll still, I'll still get some for stocking stuffers because books make great stocking stuffers. It's also the first time I've ever seen a pre-order for my book that's coming out next year. So that was cool. Um, that's a cool little uh, weird thing to see. Um, so thanks Books Are Magic too for um, giving me that tonight, which was a gift. Um, I'm just gonna read one poem uh, and, then, uh, and, then I'll, uh, and then I'll turn the floor over. Um, but uh, but thank you all. Um, this is a this is a occasion for gratitude for me, um, and thank you, Lori, again for doing this. I appreciate your holding my work in your literal hands. <clears throat> um, this poem is called "The Miracle." Um, in Islam, the uh, the sort of like precipitating bedrock miracle upon which the faith was built. Um, I guess sort of parallel to the virgin birth in Christianity um, is in Islam, it's literacy. It's, you know, the, the prophet was said to be alone and, you know, sort of fasting on this like little spiritual retreat by himself in a cave. And, um, and the angel Gabriel came to him and said, read. Um, and the prophet, like many people in his time and place in the world was illiterate. Um, and so he's like, I can't. And then, uh, and then the angel Gabriel sort of like held him and shook literacy into him and he was able to transcribe what would become the Quran. Um, <clears throat> and so the sort of like foundational um, miracle of my faith is literacy, which as a, as a Muslim writer has always been kind of interesting to me. Um, and also just, you know, pound for pound, I'm much more interested in literacy than in virginity, um, which isn't really a thing, but that's neither here nor there. I don't mean to like pit them against each other, but anyways, um, this, is a, this is a poem that sort of orbits that. <clears throat> this is called The Miracle. Gabriel seizing the illiterate man alone and fasting in a cave and commanding, read the man saying, I can't. Gabriel squeezing him tighter, commanding, read. The man gasping, I don't know how. Gabriel squeezing him so tight he couldn't breathe, squeezing out the air of protest, 
the air of doubt, crushing it out of his crushable human body, saying, read in the name of your Lord who created you from a clot, and thus literacy, revelation. It wasn't until Gabriel squeezed away what was empty in him that the prophet could be filled with miracle. Imagine the emptiness in you, the vast cavities you have spent your life trying to fill with fathers, mothers, lovers, language, drugs, money, art, praise, and imagine them gone. What's left? Whatever you aren't, which is what makes you a house useful, not because it's floorboards or ceilings or walls, but because the empty space between them. Gabriel isn't coming for you. If he did, would you call him Jibril or Gabriel like you are here? Who is this even for? One crisis at a time. Gabriel isn't coming for you. Cheese on a cracker, a bit of salty fish. Somewhere a man is steering a robotic plane into murder. Robot from the Czech robata, meaning forced labor, murder labor, forced, never sees the bodies which are implied by their absence, like feathers on a paper bird. Gabriel isn't coming for you. In the absence of cloud parting, trumpet blaring clarity, what? More living, more money, lazy sex, mother, brother, lover. You travel and bring back silk scarves, a bag of chocolates for you don't know who yet. Someone will want them. Deliver them to an empty field. You fall asleep facing the freckles on your wrist. Somewhere a woman presses a button that locks metal doors with people behind them. The locks are useful to her because there is an emptiness on the other side that holds the people's lives in place. She doesn't know the names of the people. Anonymity is an ancillary feature of the locks. Ancillary from the Latin anquila, meaning servant, an emptiness to hold all their living. You created from a clot. Gabriel isn't coming for you. You too full to eat. You too locked to door, too cruel to wonder. Gabriel isn't coming. You too loved to love, too speak to hear, too wet to drink. No, Gabriel, you too pride to weep. You too play to still. You too high to come. No, Gabriel won't be coming for you. Too fear to move. You too pebble to stone, too saddle to horse, too crime to pay. Gabriel, no, not anymore. Are you too gone to save, too bloodless to martyr, too diamond to charcoal, too nation to earth, you brute, cruel pebble, Gabriel, God of man, no, cheese on a cracker, mercy, mercy. Thank you, Kave. That was that was beautiful. Okay, so we we I see we have two questions. I'm going to ask a couple of questions, which will give all of you a little bit more time to drop your questions in that Q and A feature if you have them. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to what you're interested in, um, and then I'm gonna do a quick round of thanks and some some business keeping and kick it back to Michael to to say good night to everyone. Um, so my first question for our readers tonight is what has sustained you through this past year? Um, and I thought it was only fair for me to answer my questions also. Um, so I'm going to quickly do that and then we can just kind of go round robin, uh, maybe in the order we read so that there's no pressure for who should speak next. Um, and uh, the things that have sustained me in 2020 I'm being really honest, are my child, um, because I, I have to keep going for him, um, and french fries, which I've eaten almost every day, 
and uh, Netflix and Hulu and all the variety of streaming services that exist, um, which allow me some time out of my own brain uh, where I have spent way too much time in the last 12 months. So, so that's my answer. And Chris, uh, if you could let us know what's been keeping you going in 2020. Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, the Popeye's spicy chicken sandwich, which I think I've eaten maybe once a week since pandemic started, sometimes more than once a week. Um, but really like the friendships I have forged before the pandemic that sort of I've been leaning on and and um, you know my I was gonna say Twitter, which sounds toxic, but I communicate with my friends on Twitter mostly. So DMs and just tweets from friends who are still out in the world, still waking up, still sort of moving forward have been really um, have been really getting me through. Okay, next, Megan. Megan, what is keeping you going in 2020? Uh, well, this year has been a shit show. Uh, but I work with 20 memoirists every single week. Their work shows up in my inboxes. And I know that they have a lot of fear in making that work, but you cannot tell it on the page. On the page, it is fierce and it is powerful and it is clear. Um, and every single day, I think that I can move a little bit further forward because they have in their lives. Um, and so just the mere fact that people are this brave on the page makes me a little bit more so in my life and also in my work. Uh, so I couldn't be more grateful to the uh, to the folks that put their hearts on a piece of paper and then hand those pages to me. So I see you, some of you here, and I love you a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Okay, Courtney, you're up. Yeah, so what has sustained me uh, this year? I will say first thing is marriage, um, thinking out loud. Um, I'd also say uh, I've gotten the opportunity to watch more visual, you know, you know um, more video content than I normally would have. So like, you know, I enjoyed things like The Great and I rewatched Jersey Shore. There's been several eras of programming through quarantine and they're all weird and unrelated to each other but it's been pretty good and late night taco bell yeah i feel like there are some themes here uh okay next we've got danielle danielle what what food is sustaining you oh, sorry wait did i make an assumption there no uh what is sustaining you yeah i would say Sentimentally, my, my students, I think as hard as it is to teach online, I think that it is, and as much as this year has been disruptive and terrible, I think it's disruptive and terrible for them in a much more formative stage of their existence. And by and large, they have pulled it together and just been a delight to talk to every week. And so that's been the highlight of my week, which is like a low bar because my week is mostly like I sit in my house and talk to cats all day, but they're lovely cats. So really the students are just as delightful um, and, and kind of really doing their best to be present and engaged with um, work that means a lot to me. And um, on the, the flip side of that, I think spite is keeping me going. Like there are people I wanna be alive to like um, watch terrible things happen to. And so I'm just, I'm just like holding it together by um, rage and a desire to, to be alive long enough um, to uh, hopefully be the other end of, of this. Um, and um, uh, scented candles. Um, I wear a lot of perfume, although nobody can smell me, but like, it, I don't know, soothing scents have been useful to me this year. I love those answers, but especially when you said spite, I just felt like a chill <laughs> run through me, like, yes, fuck yeah. Okay, um, and so then we're up to Melissa. Melissa, what is sustaining you in 2020? Oh my God, buckle up. It takes so many things to sustain me. <laughs> um, I really, it just feels like balm to hear everybody's stuff. I love it. Um, I also have been wearing perfume, but I have uh, been augmenting Chex Mix by putting it in a separate container and mixing in extra cheesy Cheez-Its and these weird sort of local brand like spicy pretzels. Um, so, so 
what I'm actually sustained by and running on is like my augmented Chex Mix. Um, but emotionally, I would definitely say number one is my genius, amazing partner, Danika Kelly, who is right here <laughs> listening to all of you. Um, I can't think of anyone who I could spend this much time alone in one um, house with um, and still be totally obsessed with. Um, and then all of the various spaces through Zoom where I get to hear people being honest about what's going on with them um, and how they're surviving and how they're not surviving. And that includes my classes with my students, my recovery meetings, my meditation group, um, my writing group. I have a lot of groups. <laughs> um, and I would also definitely say uh, Nailed It and Shit's Creek. Okay, and so Kava, close us out on this question. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's certainly the, the question of the hour, and a lot of, a lot of mine have been said. Um, uh, I have the great fortune of being able to hide inside my students' brains instead of my own. You know, um, my own gets really. Uh, I don't. I don't think it's super safe for me to spend a lot of time in there uh, without a sort of lifeguard on duty. Um, but uh, luckily, you know, I have a lot of students at a lot of different institutions and students not at institutions and, you know, and friends and stuff who let me spend time in their work. And it's a privilege to be able to spend time in their brains instead of my own. Um, uh, also, uh, you know, secret clandestine recovery meetings uh, uh, are a huge part of, have been a huge part of my, you know, Zoom recovery meetings. Um, like someone else said, um, also just inertia, you know what I mean? Like I, uh, I don't know. It's like, it's like easier, yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't even think I need to sort of elaborate on that a lot, but yeah, just inertia. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm alive, and it would, and it, it is still the case that I'm alive. You know. Yes, that, that feels really appropriate to 2020. Um, okay, I have two more questions, but I'm gonna kind of roll them into one because we have a few questions now from the audience, and I want to get to those. So, um, so my last question is uh, you can share either or both uh, a book or poem or piece of art, a uh, piece of music that has been meaningful to you this year and or books forthcoming in 2021 that you are so excited about that you are headed in the direction of 2021 uh, happily or at least hopefully. Okay, uh, oh wait, so I'm supposed to answer. Okay. Um, the first one uh, is um, because I am always at my heart, a 15 year old uh, Phoebe Bridger's new album, Punisher, uh, which is the soundtrack of my pandemic. Um, and as twee as that is, it's just the truth. I have listened to that album uh, more times than I could estimate. Uh, and the books, I mean, aside from all the books forthcoming from the people you see here on your screen in front of me. Um, I'm gonna go with Alyssa Washuda's White Magic coming out in April from Tin House. And I, this was really written down as my answer. I swear I did not know she would be in the room with Melissa, but uh, Danica Kelly's collection, The Renunciations coming out from Grey Wolf um, in May. Uh, those those are the two books that I am especially excited for. Uh, okay, so Chris, now I'm going to kick that question over to you. Yeah, so I think the past year I've been like really reverting into my teenage self. So I've been like listening through the catalog of Paramore and My Chemical Rom Romance nearly every day. So that's really been getting me like that's that's the art I sort of have been um, going back to on a daily basis. Um, and two books that I'm really excited about for 2021 is um, Marco, Marcos Gonzalez's uh, memoir, Pedro Siri, which comes out from Melville House in January, and Gabriela Garcia's Of Women and Salt, which is a novel, and it comes out 
from Flatiron Books in, I believe, April. Um, I've read both of them already, and I'm super excited for other people to read them. I think they're wonderful, amazing, talented, brilliant writers. Um, and reading those during like quarantine times have gotten me through too. Okay, Megan, you're up. Yeah, I have rewatched all of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. There is this really important um, monologue that she gives like right near the end where she says, uh, there's only one thing that can defeat evil and that's us. And then Willow turns all of us into slayers. And it's really nice to remember that we were all turned into slayers in 2003 and to really try to figure out what the fuck that means. I also wanna lift up a poem by um, Kim Adonizio. It's called To the Woman Crying Uncontrollably in the Next Stall. Uh, this year I have been the woman crying uncontrollably in the next stall. I probably still am her and I really needed that last line which is, listen, I love you, joy is coming. Uh, and that's what I say when I wake up in the morning right now. Listen, I love you, joy is coming. Um, 2021, not to galley brag, but I've read Girlhood 17 times. Uh, it's phenomenal. Y'all get yourselves to pre-order. Uh, it's in the link down there right now. Books are, mar books are magic. Okay, um, Courtney, you are next. Okay, so a uh, work that I've been sitting with this year. Um, honestly, I think the book that I've probably spent the most time with and coming back and forth to is uh, Nate Marshall's most recent poetry collection, Finna, which came out in August. Um, and uh, for many reasons, I, I've, I've been coming out to that note, nonetheless, I think partly because I was working on my own and Nate and I have been in conversation for so many years now that <laughs> it's hard to, it's hard to think about uh, poetry without him. And then uh, looking ahead, um, I can't say there's just there's just one book. Obviously, you know, uh, I'm looking forward to, to Kava's collection. I'm looking forward uh, to Danika's collection, actually, that you already mentioned. Um, and there's probably I'm I'm actually probably not even sure what all is coming out um, in the back half of next year. So there's probably people I'm forgetting too. Um, but in any event, I'm looking forward to the words and having more time to actually sit with them and hopefully uh, we can actually celebrate them a little bit differently next year than we did this year. Yes, here's to that. Okay, uh, we are up to Danielle. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm glad everyone else has also been watching a lot of TV because in the month of November, I rewatched the entire series of Dawson's Creek, um, but I have also been reading a lot. And um, a couple of, a book that just came out this year that's been um, kind of sustaining me and helping me think about the future is Alexis Pauline Gum's Undrowned, um, which just came out in November. And it's really beautiful, it's like part oceanography, part feminist theory, part just kind of meditation on what it means to survive and what it means to think of yourself as a mammal and therefore vulnerable and also capable of surviving more than we know that we are. Um, and a book that I'm really excited about that's coming out in 2021 is um, uh, a book by a former student of mine, Dante Almoni's Milk, Blood, Heat, which is a story collection. I think it's out in February um, and it's, it's a really gorgeous collection. And I'm excited for it to be in the world. Thank you. And you know, this it, I should tell you this tomorrow, uh, noon Pacific time, you will find a list at the rumpus uh, of the books all of our editors, uh, including me and Courtney and everybody else on the team uh, are looking forward to uh, go up and you will also be able to pre-order those books while also supporting the rumpus using our bookshop storefront. So check that out tomorrow. You'll see what, pretty much every title that's been mentioned so far and uh, lots more. Okay, Melissa, you're up. Oh my God, there's so many good things coming out in 2021. Um, and you actually stole the two that I had already written down. Uh, Danica's The Renunciations, which is, um, and I say this totally objectively, is a masterwork. It really is. Like, I've read it numerous times and it's fucking amazing. Um, I'm really excited for Kava's new book. Go pre-order it at the brand new, fresh pre-order link. I'm really excited about Alyssa Washuda's White Magic, which I have read. 
Um, Love is an Ex Country by Rhonda Girard, another memoir. Um, Suleika Juwad's Between Two Kingdoms. She's a former student of mine, incredible memoir. Um, Forsyth Harmon's Justine, Caitlin Greenidge's Liberty. Um, and I taught Natasha Trethewey's memoir, Memorial Drive, this semester, and it completely blew my mind. Um, such, it's like one of those books that made it into the thing that I'm writing actually so and I'm sure I'm going to remember like 60 other things but um it's going to be a good year for books at least what have you been watching what have I been watching <laughs> what have you been sitting with this year <laughs> um she wants me to elaborate on what I've been sitting with this year um which is mostly nailed in Schitt's Creek we're watching the show called Ted Lasso on Apple TV, which is incredibly good hearted and charming. And I will recommend that. Okay, I'm done, thank you. That's useful. I've never heard of that show. So I'm gonna go check it out. Um, and also Dickinson, I think comes back to Apple TV next month. And I love that show. So I'm really excited for that. Okay, Kave, you can answer my question and then we're gonna turn it over to the audience questions. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's it's hard to go last at something like this because I just spend the whole time thinking about all the billion trillion books and I don't want to like just wax for an hour. But um, a lot of what's been said, Danica's book was the first book that leapt to mind, you know, um, uh, her first book was one of my favorite books the year it came out and it's still a book that I teach from and um, go to all the time. And uh, yeah, I just I'm I and like every other person in the poetry world is like super, super hyped on that. And so, um, yeah, that's one. Uh, Courtney's book is coming out in March. Is that right? And I haven't gotten to, I haven't gotten, Courtney hasn't sent it to me yet, which frankly, I wasn't going to bring up because it's a bit of a sore spot between us. Uh, he, he doesn't know that this is a sore spot, but um, uh, it's a sore spot that I've been harboring this resentment that I haven't been sent this book yet. Uh, but yeah, I think it comes out in, is it March or February? I think it, it comes out early next year. It's and, February. Uh, February. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, see, everyone's getting it before. Even in my head, I was like, guess I'll just have to wait till March to read it. You know. Uh, so yeah, I'm excited about that. Um, Gabby Garcia's book um, uh, has already gotten shouted out. Uh, she was one of our students here at Purdue and is just an absolutely brilliant dynamo. And it's called Of Women and Salt. And it's just going to blow everyone's minds. And I'm hyped on that. Hyped on Melissa's girlhood, you know. Um, uh, I also, um, I've been reading every book I can find by the Spanish novelist uh, named on, I don't, and I don't speak Spanish, so I apologize, but it's like Andres Barba, B-A-R-B-A. -A. I might not be saying that right, but um, but he, uh, I've just been everything that I can find from him that's been translated into English. Uh, he's like right now my total obsession. Um, I'm just reading like everything he's ever written. I just can't get enough of him. Um, <clears throat> Garris Abdul Malakian had a great book of poetry called Lean Against This Late Hour that was actually published this past year, but I think a lot of people slept on it because a lot of people sleep on poetry and translation. Um, but it's called Lean Against This Late Hour by Garris Abdul Malakian. It's one of the it's one of the best poetry books I think I've ever read, period, you know, without qualification. Um, it was translated by Idra Novi, uh, Idra Novi, I don't know how to say it. Um, and it was it was really wonderful. I've also been reading a lot of like poetry from antiquity. Um, uh, like Enhedwana and like Patakara and uh, you know that sort of stuff but I, I don't know I don't know that um, you know 43 century old poetry is uh, is going to be super in vogue in 2021. Um, I've also in in terms of non people have talked a lot about Netflix and stuff like that but I've also been playing a lot of uh, NBA 2k uh, with uh, my friend the transcendent poet Jose Olivares, who has a, another wonderful book that everyone should read called Citizen Illegal. Um, we play like almost every day. And that's been like a staple of my, uh, a staple of my um, quarantine is just like playing 2K with Jose. So um, that's a non Netflix, non book thing too. Oh, the best poetry book ever. I, I, I didn't say it was the best poetry book ever. Uh, I just said it's like one that I'm really enamored of. I want to, I want to be uh, sure to not be, but uh, it is a really, really wonderful poetry book. It's called Lean Against This Late Hour. It's by Garrus, G-A-R-O-U-S, 
Abdul Malikian, A B D O L M A L E K I A N. I think if you Google Lean Against This Late Hour Poetry, I'm sure it'll come up. Okay, thank you all. So I'm gonna read a couple of questions from our audience and um, I'm, I'm actually just, we can all maybe unmute ourselves and whoever um, whoever the question speaks to can just jump in. We don't, I'm not gonna do the whole round robin thing because uh, I don't know if everyone will wanna answer all of these. I'm gonna start with Carlos Gonzalez's question. Uh, how do you focus on projects, deadlines, literally fucking anything in times like these? How do you not do what I've been doing and just nap a lot? Uh, I would love to know this too. Um, although I don't nap a lot, but I would like to. That's all I really want to do. Um, so so how, how do you guys continue to focus on your work while the world um, does what it's been doing? Whoever wants to to jump in. I mean, in defense of napping, it's, it's a really good year to nap. Like, this is a year where you do as much work as you need to do to stay alive. And I realize that that is system structurally like going to be a lot more for some of us than others. But if you're in a position to nap and still like stay alive, then like nap all you want, really. <laughs> Anyone else have tips on focusing on work during during times like this? Yeah, I, I think uh, I think one of the things that's helped me right is actually kind of like along the lines of that in, in defense of napping, but it's uh, it's been embracing slowness and like trying to decouple like my work from productivity, if that makes sense, at my creative work at least, like really embracing it and incorporating it as part of my leisure has been really, really helpful at a time when there's been so many other stressors like barrowing down on me. So it's um, it's been thinking of it more as that like joyful, that joyful departure um, that it was at the beginning and like, you know, not feeling bad about or trying not to feel bad about not writing when I'm not writing, just like setting things aside, being a bum on the couch at times, like, you know, taking walks and, or just generally not doing anything, but understanding that that is still productive because while that's still happening, I'm still in taking stimuli, I'm still in taking information, I'm still in, in taking inspiration. And eventually uh, when I do come back to sit down and gather myself and gather words, there's something there at that point. And uh, it was more of a psychological hurdle than anything else to get to that point. I have to say, nobody who knows me will think this is true, but it, this year, this pandemic is the first time I've ever like not answered an email the second it arrives in my inbox. It's the first time I've allowed myself to just kind of disconnect for like a full 24 hours from work or um, do things like uh, the rumpus has an enough call, a column called enough that I, I, I run myself um, about sexual assault and, and rape culture and I've put it on hold because my brain simply couldn't handle it and everyone was really understanding we had about 100 accepted pieces and they were like we get it we'll be with you next year when you're ready to run these um I've never done anything like that I don't tell people I'm sorry I need a break um so so I think one one thing I've taken away from this year uh and the way I've gotten through it is to learn that it is okay to take a break before you before you break. So um, yeah, I'm grateful if there's, if there's something I'm grateful for from this year, it's that. Okay, um, does anyone else have an answer they wanna to share to that question? If not, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip over to someone else's question. Yeah, real, real quick. Um, my son is 12 years old. Uh, the year he was born was, was pretty rough. I was on the ground with postpartum depression most of the time. And, and when I was on the ground, I wasn't making work. Uh, and other people were, they were making work and they were standing up and they were writing and they were teaching and they were putting their bodies in the street and they were fighting because I needed to be on the ground for a minute. I needed to take care of myself. Um, and right now I'm up, uh, and there are other people who need to be taking care of themselves right now, whether it's 
because of their health or it's because of their family's health or because they're involved in organizing and rapid response, or maybe they can't walk through the world the way that I can right now with the various privileges that I carry. So I'm up and I'm gonna fight the way that other people fought for me. And I really think of this as a as collab as a collaboration with all of us in the world. Cause sometimes there are people who need to like you 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 tap out if you need to take you get to take care of yourself. You get to take care of your families. You get to rest if you need it. And there are other ones of us who are going to be standing up and then all of that is going to come back and reciprocate and we just we go back and forth and this is how we take care of each other um so i show up to the page because there have been times that i haven't been able to and other people did so um so thank you to those of you who were up when i was down and uh and i'm up now uh so i have to say selfishly i hope that means we're going to see some writing from you megan too because yeah. I love seeing you writing from you. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to a question that isn't about 2020 uh, so that uh, maybe we can, and I think I think this will be our last question. Um, and this is from Marissa Russello. And she would like to know after publishing your first book, how did your life change as well as your writing process? So we can step away from 2020 for a minute and think back to your first book and what that did to your world. Um, anyone want to jump in? I don't have a book, so I can't answer that question. <laughs> you have a book coming out. You have a chapbook coming out. Yes, in 2022, which feels like an impossible dream right now. Um, so, it, so come back to me in 2023, and I'll and I'll answer that. I promise. But Kave, since you just jumped in, why don't you share how uh, your first collection maybe shifted something for you or or how, how it changed your, your writing process sure. or life? Sure, yeah, I kind of brought that on myself uh, by being a smart ass. Um, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I wrote my first book um, in a time of like pretty kind of like, her medical monastic poet life, you know what I mean? Like I didn't really have any responsibilities. I didn't travel. I didn't really honestly have very many friends with whom I interacted very often. You know, me and my then partner now spouse would just kind of wake up every day and, uh, and you know, make a pot of coffee and a pot of tea and like sit at a table and read and write with each other for like, um, I mean, eight or 12 or more hours a day, um, every day. And we had to teach, um, two days a week. And that was like the extent of our responsibilities. And, um, and it was just this really sort of lucky privileged, um, yeah, it was, it was really the sort of like top of the mountain creatively. Um, uh, you know, and we were, we were keen to that then, you know, we were like, there will be other plateaus of, um, you know, professional success, you know, we were making, um, I think each of us were making $14,000 a year, um, pre-tax, um, uh, at that point. And, um, you know, we were sharing like a single room, um, in Tallahassee, Florida, but, um, but we were like, I mean, that was the very much like the top of the mountain for us, um, creatively, um, and then, uh, and then, you know, the book came out and one, and I, and I sort of traveled around and, um, got to meet a lot of people and, uh, you know, kiss a lot of metaphorical babies as it were. And, um, and, uh, and my life just got a lot noisier and a lot busier. Um, and it filled with a lot more, um, people and exciting opportunities and, um, and also responsibilities, you know, people began to depend on me in a way that nobody really did. Um, and, and so I found that I began to go to, you know, where um, that first book had a lot of poems that felt to me very loud and super saturated because my nose, my, my nose, my life was so sort of noiseless and quiet. Um, so I would like sort of manufacture that sort of like super saturation in the poems. Now I find myself going to the 
poems and sort of making quiet spaces and trying to sort of like build out of, build out of silence and try to um, use silence as an architectural element in the poems as opposed to language or sound. Um, and that's completely a function of um, the way that my living has changed in the intervening five or whatever years. Um, Thank you. Does anybody else want to speak to this? I won't, I won't call on anyone else. I just say, I mean, I think part of why it took me so long between books was that it took me several years after my first book came out to get back to the place where I felt like I could fail. I think that that is a necessary part of drafting anything is that you're always sort of trying to write something you haven't done before or seen before and don't know if you can do, whether it's technically or emotionally, like you're trying to do work that scares you. Um, and once I felt like other people were invested in it, it took me a while to feel like my brain and my headspace belonged to myself again. Um, but the flip side of that is I think once I got out of that space and came back to my work, um, I kind of went all the way to the other end of it. And I feel like I was able to do weirder, riskier work um, and be braver in my work because I sort of got past that place of exposure and thought, well, I already, just by publishing a book have achieved a career that my younger self would have dreamed of. So like, what am I, what am I doing with what's left but doing something that feels new and meaningful. And I think that gave me permission um, to get back to making work that scared me again. <laughs>